briefly how this is going to work is that uh, I'm going to kind of give you a sense of the panel and do, then do about five minutes on my take on the future of storytelling. Just throwing out some ideas and each of the panelists will do about five to seven minutes and then we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. If you do have a question, we ask that you stand up so that we could get good video of that. You stand up, tell us who you are, where you're from, and then let the, the question rip to whatever panelists or combination of panelists you'd like to address. So uh, with that said, I'm just going to get going here. The, in the, um, I was asked to kind of give a perspective as to what I, we're going after in this panel, and I wrote this. In an age of unprecedented instability, with the climate system and capitalism showing signs of breakdown, how do we navigate the challenges inherent in life today? What is the story of our age? The poet, prophet William Blake knew that luminous details are at the core of all true storytelling, and the internet and its capacity for spreading the news virally around the planet make our time potent for narratives that ring true with our massive economic disparity, issues of violence, race, gender, and orientation, and ecological uncertainty. So our panel of five artists who approach narrative from different perspectives are going to give a short talk. They're going to discuss how they see the ancient art of storytelling evolving to communicate something deeper than the industry-generated cultures narrative to meet the deep needs of 21st century dwellers. Do we have any 21st century dwellers here today? <laughs> One or two. <laughs> it's always good to check with super audiences with the cases. So my name is Paul Nelson. I'm a, a poet and an essayist. I run a nonprofit called Seattle Poetics Lab, or SPLAB for short. And I'm the author of A Time Before Slaughter. It is a serial poem that reenacts the history of Auburn, Washington, which was originally known as the town of Slaughter. When they realized that that's maybe not the best name for tourism, they changed it from Slaughter to Auburn. Mm -hmm. Our panelists are Honora Foa. She lives in Atlanta. She's the director of Mythic Journeys. We have Berna Gelman from London. She's the writer-director of Happy Endings. Matthew Cook, also a writer-director. His film, How to Make Money Selling Drugs, is, uh, is showing? Is that showing? Yes. Today. Showing today? So if you're interested in a second career, yes. well, I would recommend that. And Mimi Machado Luces, who uh, it, it just doesn't seem to get tired ever, and she's the director of La Vida en Black. She's from D.C. And tell me the name of the film that screened about the Cubanos and the music. And um, Pasos Latinos, a Mambo Mitchell. There you go. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I, I've also done about 500 interviews, people like Allen Ginsberg and Rupert Sheldrake and Gene Houston. And, uh, lots of poets, and, and I'm going to start very briefly with uh, my take on interviews. And Myrna, I know, is interested in gathering the stories of Suba people, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, I remember going to Vancouver, BC, and doing Latihan, and then afterwards there's some small talk. And so I said uh, to Lester, I said, so what year, what year were you opened? You know, it's kind of like, what's your sign almost? Not, not that I was hitting on it. <laughs> and, he, and he said, 1957. And I, and I choked on my coffee. Game. I said, hold on, let me do this. And I got out my recorder and I said, tell me the story again of how you were opened. And, and he said, I was opened in 1957. And we were in Coombe Springs. And we'd been doing this work. And the leader. Uh, he said, gentlemen, I've taken you as far as I can with this work. If you want to go any further, I suggest you listen to these men. And in walked, according to him, these two dark-skinned men. And they told us, relax, begin. <laughs> and he said, I didn't know what to do. And about a half an hour later, he said, finish. And then I went across the street to a park and sang at the top of my lungs. I sang, sung hymns at the top of my lungs for two hours. <laughs> and that's how it was open. And that little story, you get it. You just give people just a little opening. And especially in this community, it's amazing the kind of stories that you can hear. One other quick story. I, I, my daughter uh, uh, introduced me to the dean of the journalism school at Northwestern, where she was going to school. And, and I told him the story about coming in at Starbucks, her first job, and seeing her mopping the floor and asking the assistant manager, does she do a good job with it? And they're like, yeah, Rebecca, she's great. And I says, because she never mops the floor at home. <laughs> and I said, after four years of getting a journalism degree, that's how she's going to have to make a living. And he said, you know, not really, because there's always going to be a need to tell the story. And he said, a lot of people were saying that about the music business. 
And then he said a little thing called iTunes came along. So how do we reinvent the delivery system is the question we're still asking in journalism. And my daughter just accepted yesterday a job at US News and World Report in DC. So she's, she's got to be so, so interviews, um, uh, interviews are a great way of opening up and getting to know people and getting to learn a little bit about their own process of individuation. And if we weren't interested in that, we probably wouldn't be here, I'm guessing. So interviews, one way in the future, because I think they're very undervalued art. Um, and then, of course, poetry. And I'm the only poet here, so I've got to hold up the, the poetry banner. And so I'm just going to talk about a few things that interest me in poetry and then move it on. I've always been very interested in spontaneous composition. Uh, Charles Olson uh, called it projective verse. Robin Blazer, the practice of outside. In, in describing projective verse, Olson said it's a use of speech at its least careless and least logical, which is really interesting. Also in that landmark essay, he said that um, he wanted to know what stance toward reality brings such verse into being. And when I first read that, I said, he's talking about whole systems. He's talking about the interconnected nature of reality. But he was writing in 1950, and I was looking at it in 1995. So I had the benefit of 45 years to be able to get a better beat on that. And I think the highest manifestation of open form is the serial poem. Nate Mackey is an amazing exemplar of that. Uh, he's got this serial poem that goes in two strands that interweave. And he's been doing this for about 30 years. One strand is called Mu which is short for muthos, or that word that preceded myth that comes from the mouth. Also, mu is a, um, a, an abbreviation of the lost continent of Lemuria. So that brings in different kinds of uh, possibilities regarding his narrative. And that thread, mu, is, is, uh, we, is, is woven in and out with a, a thread called Song of the Undumbulu. And this comes from Dogon cosmology in West Africa. And he heard a field recording, uh, a French field recording in the 50s. It was taken in the 50s. I think he heard it in the 60s or 70s. This was this funeral rite to, to the dead and to these spirits in doggone cosmology that aren't quite human, but are sort of prototype humans. They're striving to become fully human. Sort of like us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Robert pointed to himself. So this, so this, uh, this um, serial poem is what Blazer calls a narrative of the spirit. And in many cases, it reenacts history, as in the case of mine, starting with Auburn, Washington, and then moving out to the bioregion of Cascadia, which is the Northwest, commonly called the Northwest, but also includes much of BC. So Portland, Oregon, Seattle, Washington, um, and Vancouver, BC, and, and places close by are part of Cascadia. So those are parts of poetry. The bioregionalism aspect I'm very interested in because I've facilitated two Cascadia poetry festivals and begin to gather the uh, bioregional poets and begin to get that dialogue going again after September 11th, the border between US and Canada, right there by the Peace Arch, ironically, uh, has been a lot tighter, as you can imagine. And so to renew those connections with our brothers and sister poets there in Canada has been very important to me. I also think that um, sound poetry is going to be huge in the future. Um, different, and that's been around for about a hundred years, with poetry that doesn't really use words per se, but more sounds. Michael McClure has these great ghost tantras that include English, but also words like <laughs> So it's a great way to get emotion across without using language. It's something that transcends language. And then what I'll end with is talking about our August Poetry Postcard Fest. This is the eighth year that we've done it. Poets from all over the world sign up. This year we have 425 around the world, mostly North America, but some from the UK, some from Australia, one from Japan, a couple from Germany. You get on a list and you agree to write a poem every day in the month of August. And so you look at your name on the list and then you have the 31 people below you and they're gonna get cards from you, right? So it's a lot of fun and the idea is that you're gonna be writing spontaneously on the card. You're not gonna cook it here and then write it. It's almost like calligraphy where you have to be really attuned to the moment. And I've, I'm writing, doing my practice here. And we went to the volcano, uh, to, the, um, to the pyramid yesterday. So I'll read these two and then pass it on. And this one went to Kelly Osborne in Eugene, Oregon. The epigraph from Denise Levertov. The whispering silver of your dryness sounded close at my ears. And Puebla Pablo fights the dryness with fizzy water. 
feeds the pigeons leftover chicharrones, eats sweetbread, rushes for el baño, <laughs> otra vez. <laughs> the straight cat with two different colored eyes will eat chicharrones too, but not Bhakti, who tracks mudras and is devotedly seen carne. <laughs> and then the other one went to Jody Plant of Salt Lake City, Levertov again with the epigraph, the city has no monopoly of intense life. Puebla has no monopoly on remedies, but has a church for it. And Cholula has a volcano view and bags of holy water for 15 pesos. But we think jugo de piña con naranja sangre more to our liking than thorns y la sangre de Cristo gráfico. Yeah. <laughs> That's my two postcard poems.